Welcome to the panel. I see people are still coming in. So nice to be in this room with you. I'm Evan from PC Gamer, and I'm so excited to bring our panelists to the stage. From Oculus VR, we have Palmer Lucky. From Sony Online Entertainment, Matt Higby. Please give a warm welcome to Chris Roberts from Cloud Imperium Games. And Tom Peterson from NVIDIA. All right, so before we get started, I want to extend our thanks to ASUS for sponsoring our panel. I'm happy to mention that toward the end of the panel, before we do Q&A, we'll be randomly selecting a winner from the audience to walk out of this panel with a prize. You may have noticed a red ticket on your chair. We're giving away this ASUS ROG G750JM DS71 17.3 inch laptop courtesy of ASUS. All right, at this time, I'd ask that you please rise, remove your caps for the PC Gaming National Anthem. That's probably good, right? Uh. All right, thank you so much for being here, guys. I'm so glad to be in a room with fellow PC gamers. Let's get started. PC gaming is open. It's high-powered, it's flexible, moddable, malleable. It's not one size fits all. It's gaming's greatest breeding ground for experimentation and original ideas. There's no platform that offers the same amount of choice, value, variety, and performance as PC gaming. So we're doing all right. But what we're here to talk about today is where we see PC gaming going from here. And I'd like to begin by getting us thinking about how we expect to be playing PC games in the next few years. Is it going to be with goggles on? Is it going to be in the living room? Is it going to be through a streaming device? Or will it still be on the mouse and keyboard? Well, I, I, have a, I have a view. <laughs> I mean, obviously, uh, PC gaming is evolving very, very quickly. And uh, we believe that, obviously, uh, it's moving to be much more of a cloud-oriented uh, experience, where you're going to be able to stream your games from your server in the cloud to any device. And not only that, you'll be able to stream in your home. But the idea of being you know, locked into your basement or locked into the office is probably not the case unless you really want that form factor or you want an experience that only big metal can deliver. But for the vast majority of experiences, especially as you know, we continue to drive technology forward, you're going to get a great PC gaming experience anywhere on any device. There you go. That's really optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be in my basement. Bring it. <laughs> so, so is that NVIDIA saying that we won't have to buy a graphics card in the future? No. <laughs> That's certainly not Tom Peterson saying that. That's, uh, no, no, no. Uh, we believe that we're going to be able to deliver just an amazing experience when you buy the, buy the graphics card and you run locally. Um, but what we're talking about is it's clear that the mobile uh, experience is becoming more and more common and more and more demanded. And the problem is today that you're getting kind of crappy content. So what we're hoping and what we will expect to see is that Services like Netflix and how they disrupted movies, there'll be services similar to that for PC gaming. And we're going to drive that as an option for PC gamers. So you can get the same contents, maybe even the same games, the same save points, 
on any device. I'm sorry, I, mean, I have a, I think I, I, think I fall more on um, Palmer's side on this one, which is, uh, for me, when I'm playing a PC game, I want the best experience possible. The reason why I like PC games is that the hardware is always changing. I, you know, every year there's new video cards by you guys or by AMD that is twice as powerful as the video cards last year, allowing me to do stuff that I couldn't have done one or two years ago. And I think the essence of me being a PC gamer is the ability to do that all the time and not have to wait every six or seven years for a new cycle of a console. Uh -huh. And so for me, yeah, I want to be in my basement or in my office with the machine that's the most powerful, having the most immersive experience possible. Uh, and so I'm always quite skeptical on the sort of cloud experience in terms of you know, latency, response, all the other things to be able to deliver that experience. I actually do believe that where you'll probably get it, because I think, I think remote rendering is actually not I've, I've, yet to, I've yet to understand how remote rendering is going to work very well. I can definitely see how you can have a lot of the game in the cloud in terms of sort of the online side of it, but the actual rendering at high fidelity, I think you're probably going to be better off just always having locally, and the, and the silicon to do that gets cheaper and better all the time, right? So, I mean, mobile devices get better and better, and long term, you're going to have some device that you will hold that as you go into your office, it will connect to your monitor and your keyboard, or you go into your living room, it will connect to your TV and your game controller, or you can have it on the road and play with it. But we're still a ways off from having silicon that can deliver the kind of graphics that the high-end stuff does. I mean, you know, there is a reason why, you know, on my Star Citizen stuff, the only sort of laptop that can really run it at the highest fidelity, the highest resolution is like an 18-inch brink, brink from Alienware with two mm -hmm. 780Ms in yeah. SI in it. And that's not I even, love you, man. And that's not even guy. close <laughs> enough to as powerful as what the desktop yeah. Won't do right. Well, so I, I mean, I I, 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 and I can't clear. I can't run 4K on a laptop. I can't run 4K on my mobile device. Yeah. And I have to say that like, if you run 4K and you've got the power to do it and you the game's set up the right way. So on Star Citizen, we've sort of built the models to be super high poly, and uh, we're not very dependent on sort of the texture resolution because we've got spaceships that are either 20 meters or a, a kilometer long. Uh, so and it all has to hold up really close. Yeah. Um, it looks amazing. So, like on a 4K, you can go and go right up onto yeah. a ship and see the panel lines in detail. That sounds exciting. Right down. But I couldn't do that on a mobile, like a device. mobile device, and yeah. I couldn't do that on something streaming. You can only do that on a desktop connected to yeah. a nice well, 4K monitor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, so let's talk about 4K. Uh, I'm going to ask the audience: How many of you are playing at 1080 resolution on your gaming PCs? Let's give a shout out for 1080 resolution, that's great. Uh, 1440, anybody? Yeah. Seen some good hands out there. Is anyone here running a 4K display or multiple 4K displays? Chris Roberts, good work. I, I, have, and to, I have to admit that N N NVIDIA was nice enough actually to send me a 4K monitor. 1600p, great. And, and some Titan, so it's, nice. but it's, but it's fun to play with. So, in terms of adoption, I mean, what do you guys expect uh, adoption of 4K to be like in the next few years? Well, I can, I can tell you about some trends. Yeah. Uh, uh, right now, 4K monitors are actually pretty expensive. And uh, <laughs> they've, they've come down quite a bit. Like last year, ASUS had a model. I don't know if we can talk about specifics, but ASUS, I think the model was $3,500 when it first came out. Now, this year, there's already been announcements of really good 4K monitors that are $700. And I think you're going to see even lower prices in 4K before the end of the year. So transition year where it goes from being super high end to becoming much more accessible for an enthusiast, that's happening right now. And multiple 4K is not far beyond. And what I'm super excited about is the price points coming down to enable you know, all of us to afford it. You know what I want is a 4K G-Sync monitor now. When is that one coming? 4K G-Sync is exciting. So everybody know what G-Sync is? <laughs> Yeah? How many people know what G-Sync is? Tell us. Okay. Tell us. I love you guys, each and every one of you. Hugs afterwards, okay? Um, so G-Sync is a technology that NVIDIA introduced in Montreal. We had some great friends come and do that. And it's a technology that changes the way monitors work. So if you're familiar with monitors today, they have a fixed refresh cycle, right? At 60 hertz or 120 hertz or whatever. But what you haven't really figured out, most of you, is what does that mean when the game is not running at 60 hertz? If the game is running at, say, 30 or 40 or, or maybe 120, what does it mean if the monitor is at a different rate from the frame rate of your game? 
Well, today it means bad things because either you have V-Sync off and you get slices of different frames and that's what tearing is. You're, you're kind of slicing up your rendered frames and putting it on the refresh. And your eye can very easily see that as shimmering as you kind of scroll left to right. Your other choice is to turn V-Sync on. And what V-Sync on does is forces your GPU render rate to synchronize with the refresh rate of your monitor. And that causes stutter and judder as the refresh kind of forces the pacing onto the game. And it's a bad experience as well, unless you're able to maintain the cadence of the monitor. What G-Sync does is gets rid of all that. And it says that the GPU rate, whatever the frame rate is, is the master. And that actually drives the pacing of the refresh. So you don't have fixed refresh rates with G-Sync. You have a, a monitor that is updating whenever the frame completes rendering on the GPU. So it, it really redoes the way the render pipeline works, mm -hmm. and uh, it makes the experience much, much better. The good news is, everybody here, you can come down to the NVIDIA booth. We have uh, production monitors uh, available. There's like 30 of them in our booth. You can play a bunch of different games and really experience what G-Sync does for you. Yeah, it's Great. pretty amazing. I mean, you actually will feel like you're getting 100 frames per second when you're getting 30 frames per second on a G-Sync monitor. It's, it's crazy, crazy good tech. And it's actually kind of neat sitting between like G-Sync and Oculus because of all that display tech that's coming to PC gaming now. And it's, uh, it's really, really cool. And it's definitely going to be changing the way that people play games, I think. Yeah, so, so in that vein, uh, what would you guys say are the biggest technological obstacles to better gaming experiences on PC? That's, that's tough. From a software point of view, the PC is an incredibly difficult platform to, uh, to develop for, um, for a couple different reasons. One of the biggest reasons is that people who play PC games are generally enthusiasts, right? These are guys who, you guys are guys who, who buy a computer, but then you're not finished, right? You're not just messing with that. You're going to throw a new video card, new sound card into it. So you have all these different hardware configurations you're constantly trying to work against. Um, like creating some sort of um, kind of better method to deal with all those permutations of, of different kinds of hardware would allow for a more consistent experience uh, for PC gamers. And that's one of the biggest challenges is that inconsistency of my computer can run this game great and his computer can't, even though they look like they're the same. Who, who knows what, what happened in there? Who knows what the brand of RAM is in there that, that could have caused that to be inconsistent? But that enthusiast audience, that's really what makes PC gaming what it is, right? Because you guys want to customize. That's another thing that makes it more difficult to uh, build games for uh, the PC audience, is you have to build crazy amounts of options into your PC game because they want to be able to take advantage of every single different kind of piece of hardware. But that's what makes PC gaming magical. That's what makes us love PC gaming, right? It's because you have the ability to completely customize your very own experience um, to what you want, to the exact experience you want. And now we see that evolving beyond just your hardware configuration to the exact gameplay experience you want. You go invest in that and you make that happen. Or you give feedback to the developers who are making the game that you want and they'll make it happen. Um, and that's, again, really I think what makes PC gaming as great as it is. It's that level of enthusiast, uh, kind of hobbyist mentality around it. Yeah, and I, I mean, I, I would say that I would, for, you know, for me, uh, to some level, Microsoft is kind of a bit of a, a gator on uh, actual performance on PCs. Um, so I've been actually quite um, happy with the movement, you know, Mantle with AMD doing a now Direct X12, which is essentially the same kind of thing, which is allowing you to actually use the power of the hardware you've got on your computer, because it's actually very frustrating to have a really powerful PC and not get the same throughput that you could actually get on a console, mainly just because you've got this operating system that's hugging a whole bunch of system resources and it's sort of gating how you can actually get down to the hardware. So I actually think there's a fair amount of improvements that are now moving in that direction. So I'm pretty happy with that. I mean, that was one of the reasons why I backed Mantle and I'm quite happy to see sort of now finally, you know, the DirectX 12 announcement and, you know, We'll see Microsoft saying, oh, yeah, we care about PC gaming again. Uh, they, they've said that many, they, they say that, and then they don't, and then they sort of don't pay attention to it, and then they get back on it. But, I mean, that's what I think. I mean, I, I'm honestly, I guess, you know, my big thing is PC gaming has always been big. It's always been around, and I don't know what happened. There was this little pit where everybody sort of felt, oh, we're not really a gay. You know, PC gaming's not a platform, but... As far, as far as I've known, PC gaming's always been a platform. It's probably always been the biggest platform. It just hasn't taken the same headlines. I mean, you know, World of Warcraft has probably made more money than any other game, period, in the history of the game business, including any of the big console franchises like Call of Duty or, you know, Grand Theft Auto. So I think that the platform's a huge platform, and the problem is it's just kind of fragmented because there's lots of different machines and lots of different... You know, do you have a high-end machine, do you have a low-end machine, but it's a great platform. And so for me, anything that sort of 
increases your ability to, to, to you know, the, the power of the platform is good, so changes in the operating system. I, I know, you know, like, so for instance, on, you know, Oculus, like one of the big things you guys are working on, the latency, latency is another issue, right? So controller latency, visual feedback latency, which is also what you're talking about with mm -hmm. GC. Um, so as those things change, I think the experience will just become more fun, immersive, yeah, yeah. I like to say it. Even more different. Yeah. yeah, I think a big, a big shift that's happened recently that's kind of led the resurgence of PC gaming that a lot of people don't really talk about is the, uh, the lack of piracy that's sort of built into the newer, more popular games. The more these games are online and the more that they're funded through some method other than going and buying it yeah. in a store, the less piracy affects your ability to make games and the more you can actually run a company Absolutely. off of... Uh, off of the games that you're making, yeah. right? Our, when piracy was really, really, really a gnarly problem in the early thousands, right? In the early yeah. 2000s, yeah. that's when you started seeing lots of PC gaming manufacturers just, just going yeah, off we're to, done. Yeah. we're gonna go do console stuff now because we actually can get paid. Well, I, I also think digital, I mean, the, di the shift to digital, For sure. right, makes a big difference because you don't have to get into the stores, so it's a whole different level of commitment. So you can actually have a lot more variety and you don't have to sell as many units because you know, you don't, you know, you don't have everyone along the way taking their cut of the piece of pie. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think that's, a, and, and, and PC really embraces like uh, diversity and game style and all these different things you can do. And so digital, I think, has really enabled that to sort of flourish over the last few years. Do you guys and have a number for the total software this last year in PC games alone? Total, total revenue for PC games last year. I wish I did. I, I okay, I how about a guess? <laughs> bigger than bigger than Cinema Take or smaller than Cinema Take? Oh, way bigger. Way bigger. Way so bigger. this last year we estimated around twenty-four billion dollars of uh, PC software revenue, and that is bigger than basically sports, right? No, so, is, that, uh, is that is that games <laughs> revenue or that's, software that's, revenue? Uh, that's uh, uh, in-game transactions. Wow. That's that's subscriptions. That's free to play with pay, pay you know, and digital downloads. So Man, I should get into that business. That's yeah. <laughs> so, so on that topic of obstacles, I'd like to ask Palmer what obstacles in his mind remain in terms of optimizing the experience for VR. Well, a lot of those difficulties are the same ones that you guys have mentioned. You know, the PC is a difficult platform. Um, yeah. PC is a difficult <laughs> platform. Um, it, it is a difficult platform, and it's hard to get higher performance. Um, Especially because the trend these last few years has been to get better and better looking games, not necessarily to cut latency down. Because it's sexy to say, ooh, look at the global lighting. Nobody wants to say, ooh, way less Late latency. <laughs> yeah, wow. See, it was, it was smooth. Now it's really smooth. Um, and it's not as simple as running at 60 frames a second. A lot of people think that that's some, you know, magical benchmark for consoles or PCs. Oh, this game's running at 60 frames a second. Well, there we go. They did it right. That's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of games that run at 60 frames a second that have many layers of buffering inside and all kinds of crazy shit going on that end up in latency loops that are over hundreds of milliseconds. And it's just insane. I don't know how, how, how are those games are playable. What are they doing? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, th I think a lot of the same, the same things actually do apply for, for, for virtual reality. Mm -hmm. I mean, v VR has its own unique set of challenges as the hardware advances, but I don't know um, if any of that, I, I think most of them are the same that the rest of the PC gaming industry faces. Great. And I'll just add, you know, like the, the part about digital downloads, it's totally true. Why would I pirate games when I can, you know, buy them so easily and yeah. generally so cheaply? I mean. It, it, it's more annoying to re-download a pirated copy of a game than it is to just, you know, have it all, you know, all ready to download all and all of your saved games synced to the cloud. Yeah. Um, it, that's it, my favorite use of the cloud is things that are not real time. But yeah. I mean, it was for a long time, it was spectacularly more convenient for you to pirate a game than it was for you to... I was just saying, it was, it, for a long time, it was way more convenient for you to pirate a game than it was for you to go buy it. Download. It was basically a digital download, yeah. So now that it's now that it's legitimate, people are like, "Oh, hey, you mean they weren't just trying to rip us off? They yeah. were just wanting convenience. They're willing to pay if if we make, make it, it easy, easy for them." Well, that, that's weird. A, that, that's especially the case, you know, when you're when when, when you're younger, not 18, and you, you know, I'm I'm only 21, so I guess this wasn't that long ago for me. But you know, if you if you don't have a, you're 21. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> What are we doing with our lives, you guys? Oh my God. 
but, uh, but, but I, I mean, I was using other payment systems like PayPal, you know, long before I was using, uh, I mean, no, I wasn't. I, you have to be 18 to use PayPal. But, uh, but, 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 but really, uh, did, it's not just digital downloads make it easier. It really is when you're a minor. It can be almost impossible to, if you don't have a credit card to buy a game. It's like, what are you going to do? You actually have to drive to the store in the car you don't own to pay cash right. that you got from mowing it's lawns. Crazy. It's just a huge pain in the ass. Yeah. But with digital downloads, it's, it, it, it makes it way more accessible and harder to moralize in your head. You're like, no, it's OK, because I don't have a car. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Chris, I'm glad you brought up Microsoft. Let's come back to that. Uh, how long do we expect PC gaming to also be Windows gaming? Well, don't you remember games for Windows Live? I know, I know. <laughs> I wow. love that. Wow. I, I'd like to just comment one thing. I think it's very clear, uh, and I, you know, I, I know that we're kidding around, but I think it's very clear that Microsoft cares about PC gaming. I don't want to... Uh, speak. If there's a Microsoft guy here who wants to say something, go ahead. But uh, I, from an NVIDIA perspective, we've been a long time partnered with Microsoft. Um, and it's very clear that they have very large amounts of resource dedicated to making PC gaming great. And I, I have 100% confidence that it's going to continue to get better. But um, I do think there are things to be worked on. And that's what DX12 is trying to improve. Um, but there's way more even beyond DX12 if you start talking about latency improvements and experience improvements. Because uh, we did something a, a little while ago where we figured out that, you know, the experience of the game is not just, uh, as, as um, we were talking, it's not just the quality of each frame, but it's the pace that the frames are delivered and the regularity. And that really isn't well supported today in, in kind of a general purpose operating system. You really want a real-time OS to do, uh, you know, really well-paced uh, frame delivery. And I think you can make a lot of small changes that dramatically improve the infrastructure in Windows that we're all working on. Memory sort of management stuff. Memory management stuff, and, and even, you know, different types of threads that are yeah. real-time threads, right? So. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I'd say that, that's, I mean, by the way, we're, we're going to be supporting Linux for mm -hmm. Star Citizen. Um, uh, yeah, we well, we run all we're all our all the servers are run on Linux too. So, um, so it's yeah, it's quite natural for us to do Linux. But uh, I do think that um, you know Windows will still be the dominant um, OS. Uh, but yeah, I think the big challenge actually in in making games going forward for the PC is really utilizing the multi-core aspect of PCs, right? So it's a very different way to design your software for multi-threading than it is in the old way where it was all just sort of one big game loop. And, and actually, that's actually the biggest challenge, and that was, that's one of the things that's changed with the X12, and that's what Mantle changes, is it's a, it's a way of dealing with things that's much better about you know, multi-processor, more threaded, and you're not so gated by mm -hmm. only one or two threads. Because that's, that's, that's actually the big performance issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that having you know, OS, all the, the tools on the OS, is, and you know, obviously on the graphical side, on the input side, that is more attuned to that, is kind of the challenge that will improve um, Over time. You know, PC games in general and the performance of them. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm looking forward to those, and you know, I don't mind ra rabble-rousing once in a while to, <laughs> to try and get Microsoft to focus on it and realize that it isn't all about the Xbox, and you know, they've probably got a lot more money uh, from PC gamers than I think they've even gotten from on the Xbox side over, over the years. Oh, I think that's I think, true. I think, that's their, I think that's their bread and butter. They should. I mean, they're built on Windows, so... They should make sure that people want to be on Windows and not want to go to other platforms. I mean, people are wanting, you know, making noises of going to Linux because they're afraid that you're going to have to go through, you know, the Windows 8 App Store, and everyone hates Windows 8. You know, Windows 8.1 has gotten a little better, but it's just, I think they, a, a big driver on, on, especially sort of PC on the, on the, PC gamers are a pretty big driver of buying new PC hardware. So mm -hmm. I know that you always see these reports that PCs are, Sales are on down for the sort of big business guys, yeah. but I actually think if you went out, you'd, you'd find that when I did this panel in, in Seattle, you know, I said, how, let's do it right now. How many of you guys built your own PCs out here? Love each and every one of you. Yes. Guys. So th this is why Dell or Hewlett Packard is saying they're not selling as yeah. much. It's because you can now go out and you can buy a case and you can get yeah. 
a motherboard and you can get your GPU and you can put it together and it's like building Lego. Yeah. It's not that difficult. Right. Well, and you can get performance and you save yourself a thousand dollars if you go and buy it from and it's fun. Yeah. And it's fun. It's yeah. fun to do. Yeah. And you That's feel fun. and you feel like you, you feel like you know, you're like wow, I made I my it. own PC. Yeah. Yeah. It's like you know you you, you you grew your own vegetables and cooked your own. You know, <laughs> so you're like wow. And so. I think so. I I think there's a there's huge. I think if you probably went to the various you know Chinese or Taiwanese manufacturers of all the components, they were saying, yeah, we're selling more of our stuff than we've ever Absolutely. sold before. Absolutely. So I, I so that's why I think when you see these headline news where it says PC sales are down, they're yeah. only looking at one aspect, yeah. and a big driver of selling motherboards and putting computers together is the gamers, and and, and so that's a big business. When you do Accounts that, you're buying new motherboards and yeah, video cards. Yeah, and you've got to put your operating system in each one of those things. So if you're Microsoft, well, that's out here, everyone's a bread and butter, so they should pay attention to everyone in this room. I think you're right. Um, when you, uh, we do look at this in detail because we have uh, businesses that are kind of more mainstream, and then we have businesses that are gaming-oriented. And it is very true that the PC business in general is flat to down. We all know the stats. But the gaming segment is actually growing strongly. So from an NVIDIA perspective, we love it. You know, as far as we can tell, if we were just going to talk about PCs, they're not declining at all. PCs are growing stronger. Our, our, our sales in the GTX segment yeah, have never been stronger. A, you don't need a GPU for Excel right now. No, we don't. Not care. yet, anyway. I, 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 don't, I, I look at it as uh, PC gaming is strong and growing stronger. And it's because of the content is more compelling than ever, right? And, I, and people love playing with PCs. Yeah. They, I, I think that you asked the original question was how long is, is PC gaming going to be Windows gaming? Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people treat their Windows PC almost like a gaming console. I know tons of people, myself included, that I'm on my MacBook Pro on my couch if I'm browsing the internet, and when I play games, I go sit at my PC. Yeah. And I don't really use my PC for browsing the web. I don't really use my PC for watching Twitch streams. I do. I do it when I'm Mac. sitting at my That's just me. That's just me. <laughs> I, I don't. I, 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 it used to be great a long time ago, and it used to plug and play, but I have to tell you, I'm, I'm not going to say Windows 8, but Windows 7 actually plug and plays and works better for me than any Mac. And most of the time, I, we have some Macs in the office, and they're always having problems. Yeah, I, I'm, not trying to be like, I'm not trying to do the Mac versus PC thing. I, I could care less what kind of computers people use. But um, my, my point is basically people build up these really kick-ass gaming rigs, but then they use them specifically. It's purpose-built just for gaming. They don't even want to turn the damn thing on to browse the internet because they want to well, yeah, keep it. I, I will say that I think that, yeah, you definitely would see people like using tablets much more yeah. to browse and be casual, and then when they game, they're on their PC. Right. So. And at that point, it, it, the question actually becomes, what, what functionally is the difference between a, a gaming console with a purpose-built gaming OS in it and a PC that's purpose built for playing games with Windows on it. So, well, there's another. You could make it, or, or like a, a purpose built PC OS that's just for making games, right? So, that's something that I am well, surprised. You mean like Steam OS? Kind of like that. I'm yeah. surprised that there's not a, an open source project to make a Linux OS that's purely just a, 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 uh, gaming, a, platform. Gaming, a gaming platform. An I, open it, source gaming OS? I know. I know that that is coming. I know that that is coming. I am surprised that it has taken as long as it has. And I think that that is going to be the shift when we see um, the Windows PC not necessarily being the gaming PC. And right. more people purpose building something just for gaming yeah. and just using it for gaming. And one thing I want to I mention is we, we view PC gaming as a platform. So we're, we're doing all of the work from, gra we're not just graphics cards, we're graphics cards and all the drivers and all of the software to configure games. We have a, an app that I want to take a quick plug for called uh, GeForce Experience. And what we do is, uh, yeah, that guy, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, by the way, if you have NVIDIA cards, the vast majority of you now have GeForce Experience. There's over 26 million users of GeForce Experience. And the way to think of it is, it queries the hardware that's in your PC, and it says, hey, you've got a GeForce GTX 780, and you've got a Core i7, and you've got this memory, and you're running these games it automatically configures the games, it does all the complex settings of the shaders, so that you can deliver a, sort of a guaranteed experience and a, trying to address some of the issues PC gaming has where there's a lot of settings that you have to set to get the best experience. So GeForce Experience is our, our first attempt to try to make that better as, as a platform. But I, I also look forward to the days when maybe the OS, maybe Windows will have a mode that says, hey, would you like the gaming version of Windows? And what that does is it rips out all of the enterprise stuff, and you're left with a much thinner, more, uh, more predictable OS. Yeah. Great. So I'll, I do want to leave some time for q and A. I'm going to ask you guys one final question before we move on to that and giving away this Asus laptop. Um, so outside of what you're working on, hardware-wise or software-wise, what do you want someone else to make? 
I would like a virtual reality headset. Oh, that <laughs> sounds nice. <laughs> I think I know a guy. I, 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 I would like more powerful GPUs. <laughs> and you want a space sim? <laughs> <laughs> he wants a massively multiplayer shooter. Yeah. Done. Very good. All scratching each other's backs up here. Very good. All right. So since you guys dodged that very well, thank you. Um, now I'm going to ask you, since you brought up Steam OS, uh, what do you think of Valve's initiative to put PC gaming in the living room? A lot of people think that PC gaming might not belong in the living room. Do you agree? Are you excited about it? I think it can, but I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. There's still going to be a ton of people who want to sit down at their desk, who want a desk, they want to take Keep a ruler and, and make the mouse pad be exactly here. They want to customize and configure it exactly the way they want. Right. Um, what you were saying earlier, people are going to be able to have a PC gaming experience anywhere they want. That's what, that's what PC gaming is all about right now, right? You do the exact experience that you want to have. And as that expands, it expands the potential for what games we can build on those. Right. Um, and SteamOS is going to expand the potential for what type of PC games uh, take off because it's a different gaming experience when you're leaning back and playing with a console uh, controller. But I think that that in general is just a, a continual expansion of what PC gaming is. And uh, that's really awesome. And it's, it's not necessarily just, just about the way. living room. Like I'm, I, I, I'm actually running SteamOS on my, my main desktop at home. Mm. And like, you know, something you mentioned is that PC gaming in a way is like a, pla you know, it's almost like a console where some people have a gaming PC they don't use uh, for web and stuff. I would argue the, uh, I'd make a different argument. For, for me myself, I use my rig for everything, whether it's web or productivity and gaming and all these things. Uh, the difference is that Everything these days seems to be very web-based. So if I can do my email and my word processing and my research all in the cloud, you know, like th basically through a web browser, yeah. um, really the only local thing I'm left doing with my machine is gaming. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that's really exciting because you, you know, like you, you know, you mentioned um, how cool it would be to have a, a version of Windows that strips all the enterprise stuff out in just a gaming OS. Um, I think Steam OS, even aside from the being in the living room part, it is like that. It is. Yeah. You know, it's not coming. It's here. We, we have an open source operating system designed specifically for gaming. 2014, you're the Linux desktop, right? <laughs> but, <laughs> I'm going to have to stick it on my, on my uh, PC at home. It's worth checking out. It is, it, it's really nifty. Uh, yeah, we have a couple of the, the, the boxes at work, and it's definitely really, really cool. I haven't made the shift over to it. Be careful on the install because it just wipes your drive of everything. So. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Please give a hand to our panelists before we move on to Q&A. Okay. So I'm holding a box filled with raffle tickets. Now is the time to bring out your red raffle ticket. You probably held several of them in your lives. I'm going to draw one number, one number only. Please come to the stage and take this laptop. Two, six, seven, two, five, eight. Two, six, seven, two, five, eight. Say something. Yeah, is that you? Do we have a winner? Hey. <laughs> you're very calm. Yeah. You're, right, thanks you're again. very calm. Very, very calm. Thanks again to ASUS for providing this. That's okay. Do only one for me. Jesus. <laughs> All right. We're going to give it to him afterwards. Don't worry. Afterwards. So, it's my understanding we have some mics for Q&A. Please form a line in the middle here. And I just ask that you limit your question to one question. Thanks. Hello, is this on? Hi, I'm Bridger from Team Legacy and the Tales of Citizens podcast. My question is for Chris Roberts. Uh, yesterday at the Star Citizen event, you mentioned that uh, you're going to be supporting 64-bit gaming. Do you see the, the future of gaming being 64-bit and requiring 64-bit operating systems? Uh, yes. <laughs> So, well, I mean, Star Citizen is going to be only 64-bit. I mean, it, it's like trying to hold on to the legacy of 32-bit holds back way too much stuff. And whenever we've done surveys of everyone that's back Star Citizen, pretty much 96% of 
the people that backed it already had 64-bit, and any processor you get is going to be 64-bit going forward. So, I, you know, why, why, why deny the inevitable? Hey guys, uh, where do you see the the state of like solid-state drives and how they'll affect PC gaming? I think it's the best upgrade you can make to your PC. The best cheap upgrade you can make to your PC is a solid-state drive right now, in my opinion. It's a great, great, great thing for gaming. I, I can tell you that the best upgrade is a graphics card, but right after that, <laughs> <laughs> right after that, hey, I, I, cheap, solid state. I said cheap upgrade. Uh, so I, I think I it's, mean, it's actually so your display. I know, I know. It's actually your display. Uh, I, That's I, the best I, would, upgrade. I would actually say that you should, like, Buy an SSD. I mean, it makes a massive. First of all, Windows actually boots up in like three seconds, yeah. uh, so it's sort of like a console experience all of a sudden. Uh, and it's so cheap now. I mean, you can you can get 500 gigabytes for like 200 dollars. Yeah. You get a terabyte of an SSD for like 400 dollars. Yeah. One other insane. thing I want to add. One thing to that: most SSDs are not going to affect the frame rate that you get playing a game. But what they actually do affect, and I, I haven't actually done a lot of talking about this, you'll see a very different pattern of frames. So even though you know, the average FPS may be approximately the same, uh, things like level loads and stutter stutters as you load textures are greatly reduced. I actually use it for uh, processing memory uh, from a digital forensics perspective. And I've actually seen faster load times uh, read right to the disk on my solid state drive than I have to memory. So it's, it's definitely an awesome way to go. And, and I just foresee kind of like the way games will be going, you know, being able to utilize that solid state drive, you know, here's your file, that here's your memory, you know, read, write, read, write, read, write, uh, you know, possibly affecting, uh, you know, like you said, load times a lot, and we're going to see a huge burst in uh, PC gaming from solid state drives. So thank you, you guys. Great, once, thanks. Once you're at a certain speed with your storage, I mean, the difference between RAM and your drive is, is less, right? A game like Planetside, we we don't load every single thing you're going to need when we load it because the world is just too big. So we stream things in as you're running around. And when you're streaming lo asset loads in, that causes tons of hitches. But as soon as you're on a solid state drive, gone. Yeah, it's so amazing maybe, upgrade. Maybe a new hardware configuration for PC gaming is completely eliminate the RAM with the onset of these solid state drives. You reduce it down to like a single pipeline. We'll Thanks. be talking about that in a few years. Thank you. Thanks. Hello, folks. It's Ms. Perth from MMOBuff.TV. A question for Tom. Um, with the rumors circulating around uh, Visa standards and FreeSync, do you think that's going to have any impact on adoption of G-Sync? Um, so your question is, uh, do I have a comment on a rumor about an unreleased spec? <laughs> I have no comment on a rumor about an unreleased spec, but I can tell you that, um, you know, we, we don't just release specs, right? We're enabling technology. And we're working with partners to build monitors that implement that technology. If there were someday a spec that was open that allowed us to deliver a very similar experience, we would look at it strongly. And if it, if it delivered a benefit that was good for everybody, we would consider it. But uh, today, that is not the case. Today, we had to go kind of do the heavy lifting. We designed a module, we invented technology, and we've driven it through the ecosystem. So, uh, I don't feel like vapor is going to affect current. And uh, if that changes over time, of course, NVIDIA will uh, almost always favor uh, an open standard. Thank you. Hi, guys. Uh, so I know with Dota 2 and the international esports have gotten really, really big. And I just want to see what you guys think about the future of PC gaming and uh, esports in general. Yeah, it's huge. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a enormous esports nerd. My, my game of choice is StarCraft 2. I really like watching that a lot. Um, I think esports as a, as a uh, kind of cultural movement in PC gaming is actually really, really cool because it's so community driven. And it's really helping those of us who are making competitive games uh, know what type of things players are really looking for in these, type, in these communities. So we can go, um, you know, to people who are experts at playing these games and they're making their living off of playing them, you know? They're, that they're actually able to play, their, play games nonstop. Those guys are so good for being able to get feedback from, so good for being able to help define what the next competitive games are going to be. Um, so I think, I think esports are driving, especially games like, like my game, to be, you know, more competitive and competitive in different types of ways is very exciting right now. One thing I'd, I'd like to add to that is that I love StarCraft 2 as well. Um, but what I'm really excited about is games being designed for esports in the sense that there is a almost a caster 
panel or a, or a simultaneously view panel where you're watching a, a game live, but you can control the camera, you can yeah. control the pay. So in-game replays of uh, live sounds like a very exciting thing. Yeah, and I, I'll tell you, that does, the in-game observer stuff matters a lot. We'll spend a lot of time talking about what kind of a viewership experience is this game going to have? Yeah. Like, how can we make this be something that is entertaining to watch and entertaining to see people play? Some games, it's natural, right? Street Fighter, it's so easy. You just watch over the shoulder, you see the whole game, done. A uh, game like Planet's Item, I'm assuming a game like Star Citizen, you have to put a lot more thought into how do we contextualize all yeah. of this and make it something that's a consumable, enjoyable viewership experience. Um, but yeah, I think that that's driving a lot of game making right now. And also, I'd, I'd add to that uh, just really quickly. I like StarCraft 1. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think that esports is becoming more accessible to average people. Like, there are, there are, I know people who are um, not even super hardcore gamers that'll, you know, especially for games like Street Fighter, they'll watch Street Fighter on, 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 on things like Twitch because it's so easy to, to go watch. It's not this thing where you have to navigate the waters of when is the tournament going, where, where's the stream, where do you have to go. It's so easy to watch yourself and then to share with people through services like Twitch. And then aside from Twitch, uh, there's apparently a new IRL esports arena that's opening up in Orange County near where our office is. Yeah, it's like an arena designed just for esports. Uh, you, is it a place you go or is it a. Yeah, yeah it's a place you go to watch esports. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a bar? Yeah, but no, no, no. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a, a. Yeah, it's like a small arena. And, wow. and, and people go there and then they play the games and then people actually go and watch them. They talk to each other? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. All right, next question to the left here. Guys, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, in 2010, I attended a, a similar panel like this. Uh, Jeff Kales hosted on the Future of PC Gaming. It was the most depressing panel I've ever been to in my life. <laughs> it was basically an hour-long discussion of like DRM strategies and subscription-based MMOs. The idea that you guys would all be up there and we'd be in this PC gaming renaissance right now is amazing. My question is, kind of looking ahead a few years, uh, when we're all attending Virtua Packs with our Oculus Rifts, <laughs> what would be kind of the, the little things that are just now starting to come to the surface that, that you're seeing as really the future and the really exciting opportunities that are, you know, just starting to take off? Virtual reality. <laughs> uh, uh, and maybe you could tell me, Mr. Lucky, because like, my wife is terrified of the day that the Oculus actually drops. So, so is my girlfriend. <laughs> I'll give you uh, one thing that I'm super excited that is just now starting that I think in five years in your Oculus-based uh, future um, is AI. And, and today in games, I think AI will all agree is, yeah, you know, it's getting there, but it's not what I would call okay yet. Um, AI is about to go through a massive improvement as people begin to understand, you know, you've got these massive compute engines sitting around, you know, they're called GPUs, and you can use those to do real machine learning. So can you imagine in five years where you're playing a game with AIs that you've trained that are different from everybody else's AIs, and uh, you're, you're starting to participate in a real way with the artificial intelligence that you've grown over, over months of practice. I think that's really exciting. All right, awesome. Thanks, guys. AI is, AI is really big. I, I will definitely agree with that. We're spending a lot of time working on AI for uh, EQ Next, and it's an enormous undertaking to try to do all the things that uh, we're trying to do with that. I, I would say another thing from a hardware standpoint that I'm excited about, you really don't hear about very much, is tactile. I think, I think we'll probably start seeing more, like that's sort of my pipe dream thing, is more tactile like, feedback. Uh, that kind of goes to what you're talking uh, about. Well, but it's yeah, absolutely yeah. true. I think, well, I think, I, but I, I, the other thing I'll say is, though, that, that, that I cut you off, Palmer, do you want to? I just, just add to that really fast. I think that... Uh, one of the interesting things about gaming in general is that well, the displays and input devices have remained that. There's, you have one set of hardware that's for input and another set of hardware that's for output. And that's been the case for all of the motion tracking hardware out there and uh, most of the displays out there. And uh, the, most, the most haptics you're getting is, you know, shaking hands. And shaking hands are not next gen. Yeah. And, you know, we've been doing it for, for a long, long time and it hasn't really improved all that much. But I, I think there's going to be a future for devices that are input and output devices, whether it's VR or input, things that allow you to uh, control the world and have the world reach out to you back the same way. And I think that's, that's from audio to displays yeah. to inputs, I, I mean, they're all going to be two-way instead of one-way. The, the other thing I was going to add, because no one's mentioned it yet, but, I mean, we're working on this, and I, I think in sort of virtual worlds it's very important is the 
the sort of the ability that you as your character avatar, like I can be on my side and I've got pick my avatar and then you know, I've got my camera and it's basically recording like I speak, but you see my avatar speaking yeah. on the other side. So I mean, we're, that's like another aspect that I'm pretty excited by where you sort of really feel like you're present in the world and you know well shared I, shared I, spaces with other yeah, yeah. so you are, you can have a conversation with your virtual character with some someone else whether it's another yeah. uh you know another player it, it's in the context it's not in a little chat box oh, it's actually them talking seeing their face it's their avatar talking it's just my voice that's but it's my talk. avatar that's, that's not no you can do it you can do it right now there's a you know live driver is one of the things that we're we're, we're playing with on our stuff so yeah, you, can, you can do it i mean look if you have a logitech Webcam, I mean, it will track your mouth as you move. I mean, the text there, I mean, they're already tracking on our, the new Oculus Rift Crystal Cove. They're using camera tracking to figure out where the head position is. So all, all of those things you feed back in. So, you know, your friend playing with you in his, in Star Citizen, his spaceship comes up on the video comm and it's his voice, but you see his character in game talking to you instead of a chat box. And I think that's going to add a lot to sort of the immersion of the experience. All right, to my right. Uh, Thank you. Thank you all for being part of the panel. We appreciate it. Um, talking about Linux, what's the future? We're going to see more maybe AAA titles come to Linux. Um, I'd like to see some of the beholdens to Microsoft um, eliminated. Um, what do you think about more titles coming to Linux? And Matt, we're going to see PS2 on Linux? Uh, we don't have any plans right now to support PS2 on Linux, unfortunately. Um, I would love to. Uh, but it requires uh, a lot of work. We need to convert everything over to OpenGL, so it, it's kind of rough. Um, however, I, I think that I think that you can see more PC gaming on Linux just because there's more independent games getting made right now. I don't know if there'll be a big shift over to AAA games going to Linux anytime soon, to be honest. Just because the audience is so small, that dedicating the time to it, right now at least, maybe we see an expansion of that if we do start seeing more of these purpose-built uh, gaming OSs coming out. Well, I mean, if you're on Steam OS, you're going to have to be on Linux. But, yeah, that's but true. We'll, we'll be on Linux, um, but that's, uh, we like it. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think most that, engineers Chris. will tell you they prefer Linux to, uh, to uh, Windows, actually, uh, especially, especially in the back-end uh, server world. Um, so, yeah, I think that, I mean, the, you know, what Matt talked about is actually the, the big issue, which is moving over to sort of an OpenGL rendering pi pipeline. Uh, and so a lot of engines don't necessarily do that. One of the reasons why we can do it now on Star Citizen is because there was a, you know, a drive in, in Crytek to shift CryEngine so it also supported Linux. Uh, so so we'll, we'll definitely do it and I believe it. I actually think you will probably see more games move to Linux. Um, whether or not it's going to be universal, I don't know. It'd be nice if it was. It'd be nice to have uh, competition as, a, as an operating system platform. Um, so. Generally, I don't see much. The only barrier I see is the is the is the rendering pipeline barrier, and and it is it is not trivial if you go from DirectX 11 rendering pipeline to a, an OpenGL rendering pipeline. You have to do a fair amount of work to do that. Uh, but once you have it done in an engine, so I will say that the likelihood of it happening going forward is is going to be increasing because you know all the major engines are supporting Linux. So when all the major engines support Linux then out of the box it's much easier, right? Sure. So I think you guys have a custom engine yeah. in planet side. So that's an undertaking. But you know, once you know, uh, you know Unreal's working on Linux and CryEngine's working on Linux and Unity's working on Linux and you know some of the other engines, then it's much easier to For sure. make it work on Linux. And then 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 I think you do it because why not? Uh, one thing I'll add from our side is that we're going to continue to make the best Linux driver in the world. So there you go. <laughs> All right, let's see if we can fit in a couple more questions. Sorry to interrupt on the left. Hey, uh, a lot of things that, uh, you know, a lot of individuals and companies are very excited about cloud computing. And I feel like one of the things that never get discussed in that whole, uh, whole plan for the future is in America, there's a lot of places that even if they do have broadband, it's the particular quality of the bandwidth is very low. There's a lot of issues with consistent service quality. How does the industry plan overcoming that if we're going to move to a cloud-based system for a lot of this stuff? Uh, I, can, I, I can actually comment on what we see today. So uh, you're probably aware that NVIDIA has a product called Grid. And what Grid is is exactly that. It's a, it's a device that we sell to uh, people that want to provide a cloud gaming service. Now, um, we've, we kind of look at uh, the primary problem with cloud gaming is not so much the downstream bandwidth. There's usually plenty of downstream bandwidth. The problem is sort of this up, upstream round trip latency. Because what's happening is there's an event that has to go all the way up to the cloud, update the render, and then stream back. And that's unique 
for gaming versus movie streaming. So uh, what we're actually uh, focused on primarily is latency. And um, you're right, there's no easy solution for speed of light kind of latency problems, but we're so far away from that today. And there's some really easy, big things to fix um, that I think you're gonna be surprised with the quality of, of game streaming uh, available even today. We've already showed demos streaming from, you know, Norway, streaming from Paris. And, and the truth is that that adds about 100 milliseconds, even distance streaming. Um, and that is less than the latency of an Xbox or a PS3 today. So if you think about the latency, I think you, you really need to look at what are the real numbers of latency in the network and how do they compare to the latencies that you're already experiencing. And you will be surprised that the network is not the barrier. Am I right? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I will say, I mean, I think Matt will say too, is like, I mean, latency is a major problem. Yeah. Especially if you want to have a multiplayer game because you have to be mostly server authoritative, which means that <coughs> your instruction has to go to your server, the server has to process it, and has to go back and tell the game what to do. So <coughs> anything that would be about reducing the latency for me would be a great thing. I mean, I, I, you know, people talk about the next set, you know, generation of the internet, and it would be nice to, the late, the late, I mean, the, the thing that's strong about the internet also kind of creates the latency, yeah. right? Yeah, you're right. So, <clears throat> so I don't know how to quite solve that because it's not just a bandwidth issue. It's not just how much you can go up. It's also how long it takes that information yeah. to get to the point it needs to get. And the reliability of the connection. That's a huge thing, especially with residential <coughs> broadband. I mean, you're some dudes torrenting Game of Thrones. Maybe you're, maybe it's you, who knows? But your, your internet connection is like, you know, it's going to be shared. You're going to have a lossy connection. And I think especially the input problem, like you're saying, that's the biggest thing to solve for yeah. the majority of games. If you're playing Civ V, which you ought to be, uh, it's no problem. <laughs> no worries. If you're playing Planetside or Call of Duty, those are the tough ones. it's tougher. But, but, but I do think that they're solvable problems, but they're hard problems. Yeah. Well, I think when you say it's solvable, there's different levels of solvable. Like it's like, oh, 100 milliseconds. Well, that's what you'd get with an Xbox or something else. Like, and it's also five times more latency than you can tolerate with a virtual reality headset. Yeah. So you know, to tolerable is yeah. it, you know, fixing the problem is difficult. I I don't see a pipeline in the near future where cloud-based rendering technology is going to be remotely plausible for virtual reality because we're already struggling to get to. We're already struggling to make it work, and having it be 100 miles away makes yeah. things much harder. I, I agree that VR, it seems hard to believe that that could be a, a, a good experience stream. Well, it, it's beyond just VR. There are lots of games that rely on very low latency input. They're like Quake 3. That game would never work as a streaming game. It doesn't matter how much you optimize. It is such a Twitch game that you're never going to be able to get it working. Sure. But at least not in the foreseeable future on a streaming thing. And I worry about streaming technologies. You know, it, it's easy to say, oh, it's an option. It adds this new option for gamers. But at the same time, it encourages certain types of games to emerge. It encourages games that are able to work on that option that is going to become less of an option for certain publishers, I imagine. And I think that there's certain types of games, like a Quake 3. Will that be game be able to get investors? Will it be able to get a green light from a publisher when they say, by the way, this game can't work on a dominant right. distribution platform? Yeah. Um, I'm hoping that virtual reality can help maybe. Push the other way. That's I'm helping it can push that trend a little bit the other way. I'm, I'm a big believer in big horsepower in, in, in your house, not somewhere else. I, li I like to own my hardware and I like to own my software. But are you, but are you, are you, are you, are you worried that any major publisher is like pushing on a streaming game? I, I'm not aware of anyone that is. Doing no, that. Oh no, they're not pushing it yet because it's so bad right now. You could, right. you could never, you know, like for a game like Civ Five, you probably could push it as a streaming experience, and it wouldn't even be that bad. Um, if you tried to push something like a Call of Duty. Everyone, even the, the, you know the peasants, would know that it was a terrible experience. <laughs> and so, um, I, but, but as the technology gets better, I think that you will see publishers, you know, going that direction, and saying, "Hey, this is another way." You know, it, b before we required the game to you know connect online to even you know you know in order to work properly. Now the game I, won't even show up I, if you're I not know, connected to the like, internet. When everybody is quite happily chipping in to deliver the hardware to render your game already. Why take on the ownership of the hardware that then you have to upgrade and do all the rest stuff for? So, I so mean, why every, why would they want to do it? Well, I'm, not, I'm just saying it's like right now, like every single mobile uh, device manufacturer is pushing so hard to increase the horsepower and the oh, rendering sure. power 
And the same is happening on the PC side. Everyone's fighting to get the fastest GPU or the fastest CPU. So that's all, that's all happening right now, and people are upgrading. And the, the, I mean, if you think the upgrade, you know, craziness on PC is bad, I mean, there's nothing like compared to the mobile phone. You're pushed to buy a new mobile phone yep. every year, right? And everyone's like, this one's four times as fast, and this one now can render this and do all the rest of stuff. So that's already happening for you. So why, if I'm someone that's publishing a game, do I want to take on ownership of that? Because that's, that's a lot of investment that you basically throw away every year because it's got to get better. You, I mean, I hope, wrong, I hope what's they wrong hope, with the system right now? It's great. Everyone I hope they're thinking so. the same way you are. Well, I'm pretty sure they are. I mean, you know, all the ones I talk to, I've not had a single one of them sort of go, hey, well, this is the future of our business. We're just going to put it all on cloud. They definitely want to have games as a service, 100%, right? So everybody sure. wants to sort of have that um, kind of relationship with the gamer where it's not just they buy the game and they forget about you. It's just, it's more of a sort of experience and they're ongoing playing. And you can see that on, you know, whatever, Grand, of, Grand Theft Auto and, you know, the online stuff. And really Call of Duty really is a sort of online sort of experience that they just upgrade the game every year and now it's got shinier graphics, but it's the same core experience. Sure. But I, I don't see the publishers wanting to get into the hardware ownership business. I mean, it, it, I wouldn't if I was them. I mean, I don't think, they, correct, I don't, I don't I, think I, it's I, all I of them. I think, I, I I think there are some that would be interested. I mean, if you think about it, it is the ultimate form of DRM. It's, you know, there, there's literally no way to run the content locally. It, you're just getting it from somewhere else. You never even have the game files to crack anyway. Um, I think it's interesting that you said that you like using web services for all your for all your software, but not but for games. You said I want it in my house. I want it here. Well, I, a lot of that is it's it's purely based on performance. Yeah, you know, for, for, for web best. for web like and like I mentioned, what I really like about um, like Steam versus piracy is all my all my saved games are in the cloud. That's fantastic. It yeah. means that I, my computer can break down. I can lose my computer. Whatever happens, I know that I'm I'm safe. Sure. Um, and that's where I I really like cloud mm -hmm. services. I, I'm less a fan of cloud services when, and like video streaming, same thing, it's really great, but when it, for, 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 PC, for PC gaming, it's very difficult. And I'm very biased because maybe we can solve streaming games for console quality experiences, but virtual reality is really pushing my brain in a different direction to where I'm going to be maybe irrationally. <laughs> to me, I think of it as just another platform. It's just like an iPad, you know? You don't have the exact same gaming experiences there. Yep. I think streaming, we're just going to have to start thinking about as a different, different type of platform. Certain games will work on it. Certain games will work extraordinarily well on it. Maybe certain games will work even better on a streaming service than they would somewhere else. Well, it's one thing Something I'm really excited. Access from multiple devices, and you can have that gameplay experience in multiple places. Streaming service. I'm a fan of, of, of the idea of using uh, cloud services to do things like physics rendering or AI rendering in the, cl in the cloud, where you can, you know, rather than having all of this computing power sitting in your PC generally unused, you can just pull it on demand from this place. That's sure. vastly more powerful. And I mean, it's, that's, what our, that's what games like mine do, right? Yes, they, they and I, I think that that's very, very promising. It's the actual, you know, send a command to a server, render it, and then pull it back. That, that's the part I'm very skeptical about. All right, we're going to have to leave the mysteries of the future of PC gaming right there. Thank you to our panelists. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, everybody.